Coming up today on Locked On Texas Tech, it's year one in West Texas for new Red Raider offensive coordinator Zach Kitley. We'll discuss Coach Kitley's approach to a balanced offense and just exactly where he learned how to put together a game plan. Also on the program today, we'll get to another oddity from the depth chart released this week for Texas Tech football. It's a pair of field goal kickers, and we'll discuss the Old Testament as it relates to a quarterback decision. Did Joey McGuire consult the good book? Coming up today on Locked On Texas Tech. You are Locked On Texas Tech, your daily podcast on the Texas Tech Red Raiders, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We're going to start this thing off right. Thanks so much for joining us on Locked On Texas Tech. Once again, your team every day. Appreciate you making it your first listen as part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Subscribe on YouTube or anywhere you get your podcasts. I'm Casey Cowan with the only Chris Level, and we are inching closer and closer to Texas Tech game day, Chris. But there's going to be something special about it, just aside from the return of Red Raider football in West Texas. It's the return of a familiar name in West Texas. There's a legend on the campus by the name of Wes Kitley, and now he's got some company among Kitleys back in love. Zach Kitley, the new Texas Tech offensive coordinator, has gotten some attention, obviously, in some other spots prior to being here in Lubbock and was here in Lubbock once before. There's a whole lot to take in whenever it comes to the story of Coach Kitley in year one back in West Texas. Zach Kitley has done damage on both sidelines uh, in that stadium. <laughs> That's right. I mean, what, what, I mean, when you think about it that way, I, yeah, I, I think at this stage in Zach's life, this is dream job for him. I mean, this is – um, he's not, you know, probably hadn't been in it long enough to be a, a head coach or anything like that, but this is dream job for him being an OC at his alma mater and he's excited. And those kids are very impressed with him as an offensive mind and a creative mind. And, you know, there'll, there'll be some issues they have to work through and we'll, we'll all find out about that offensive line together. And it's a different big 12 than he left, yeah. uh, four or five years ago, uh, then, then, you know, I mean, because I think still then it's it's the p- people are playing defense differently, and now the defenses are bottom line. They've caught up; they're much better, and they're they're the schemes, the coaches, and all that stuff. And so it's just a different a different Big Twelve. We talked about that in a previous show. A yeah. hundred plays now to maybe seventy or eighty play range. It's just very different. But uh, yeah, let's talk some more, Zach Kelly. That'd be good. Well, what did you make of his time on campus uh, just a few years back? whenever Cliff Kingsbury was the head coach here at Texas Tech and kind of maybe just what personally you expected out of his trajectory, because I would have to think by any measure, even for those most optimistic, it's a pretty quick arrival uh, in the Big 12 or as a Power 5 offensive coordinator, isn't it? Or am I am I selling him short? No, I, I, think, you're, I think you're right. I think that Cliff was extremely impressed with Zach as a, as a GA type. He quickly moved up and learned – everything there was to know from, from Cliff Kingsbury. And, and I think people, you know, they've probably forgotten, but he turned down, he could have been standing on the sideline at many places in the big 10 and the ACC. I think he had an SEC opportunity uh, as well that, that offered him quite a bit of money and, and some money that, that some of those jobs were maybe even paying more than, than what he's getting here. So at some point, this was going to be the next step, Power 5 OC, after what he did at right. Houston Baptist and then uh, Western Kentucky. And again, if you're, if you're asking questions about Zach, I mean, and he'd love to do it uh, too, but he's going to have to do this without Bailey Zappi for the first time, you know, because both of those jobs at Houston Baptist and Western Kentucky with Bailey Zappi. But I think it, uh, it says a lot about him and probably Joey as well, that all three of those quarterbacks during this whole transition, none of them left, you know. Yeah. That that's the exception rather than the rule this day and age, and I think it says a lot about Zach as the creative mind and and everything like that. But uh, no, I'm I'm that, that's no a great one's point. more yeah nobody's more excited to be here though. That, that, that's a great point. Um, 
because it has to speak somewhat to the character of those individual players, I would think, as well, regardless of the coach, that you want to stick it out and you want to continue to compete when it's so easy uh, to be on the move otherwise in this day and age in college football. So there's aspect, there's that aspect of it uh, to them as well, just the, the the personality or the traits individually. But you also think about those guys that they're signing up to compete under, that being Zach Kitley and, of course, Joey McGuire as well, but more closely associated with those quarterbacks, that being Zach Kitley. I hadn't really thought about that part of it, but, yeah, they all – said, we're going to continue to compete and, and we want to be here coached by Coach Kitley and uh, playing for the Red Raiders. And I really wonder, you know, what Coach Kitley is going to be feeling like on Saturday night uh, as you come out the tunnel. And obviously it's got to feel a little bit more personal uh, for a guy who who has that personal connection to Texas Tech University. And I would imagine as a lot of folks will have their uh, hair standing on end whenever the, uh, the master rider runs across the field. Uh, Zach Kittley's maybe standing just a little bit higher, don't you think? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Uh, I don't know who will be happiest on Saturday because you mentioned Joey, you mentioned Zach, but West may be the happiest. Uh, yeah. I mean, ultimately, and I think that says a lot about who he is and the family and and all those things. But uh, no, I mean, Zach was he, he after that bowl game, Western Kentucky play. They played in San Antonio. He would, I think it was either interviewed the day after or two days after, but drove up to Lubbock with his dad and drove up, interviewed for this job. And then it was kind of, they put the thing to bed and now here we are. And I'm, I'm fascinated to see kind of how he calls the game and what, what his side of the ball looks like. Well, I'm glad you bring that up because we know that when it comes to his dad and, and it comes to Wes Kittley, I'm sure he's uh, taken a lot of things from Coach Kittley, the senior uh, playbook, because clearly, motivationally, there are plenty of things that will translate from track and field to football or any sport when you're talking about motivation or um, encouragement or just leadership for a college student athlete. Uh, but also curious to figure out where exactly and how exactly, by whom exactly, Zach Kitley had his football mind kind of molded as a game caller, a play caller, a guy that's going to be managing the ebbs and flows of an offense and, and what goes on within the game. And that was something that Coach Kitley actually spoke about uh, in this weekly press conference. We'll hear from Texas Tech offensive coordinator Zach Kitley. It kind of varies on who you're playing, you know, are they more of a multiple defense? Or are they more of a simplistic defense? Uh, you know, I, I was told a long time ago, the more, the more complicated the defense, the more simple the game plan should be. And the more simple the defense, the more sophisticated the game plan can be. You know, I learned that from, uh, you know, Coach Kingsbury, one of my mentors. And I kind of took that at heart because, you know, if you know where the defense is going to be, well, then it kind of simplifies from the uh, vantage point of the quarterback what you can do. Uh, and if they're very multiple and they mix things up all the time, they don't, maybe don't have so many tendencies in so many areas, you want to be able to give your players, uh, you know, different opportunities to, you know, for a quarterback, for example, to go through a progression read instead of saying, hey, they're playing this coverage, this is probably where the ball's going to go. Uh, give them more of a progression read so they just have to uh, go through reads that way. You, you know, and, and he – I love the way he phrased that because – David Yost and Sonny Cumbie and Cliff Kingsbury and Neil Brown, all these guys have come through here in, in recent years and they've all had their own twist on what the air raid is or what spread offense or NASCAR or whatever, all the different things. But, you know, people have, have, have asked, what, what does Zach run? And, you know, that there was a, you know, there's so many thoughts that, they want to do this or do that. And people thought about Houston Baptist and Western Kentucky, but what Cliff always did best. And I think this is what Zach will do is they really uh, attack, you know, weaknesses, you know, if they, so in other words, it allows you to be a chameleon of sorts. If you want to be pass heavy one week and run heavy the next, they want to be able to do that and play those games with you. Uh, I, I, I to use a basketball analogy, I'll do this often with you, Casey. Sorry, but like whenever the, the the team went to the Final Four that year, they were able to slow it down and work the clock and play half court, or they could run and gun with the best of them. Ultimately, Zach Kitley, this is how he wants to coach offense. We want to be able to do a variety of things and major in it on some weeks. Some weeks will minor in in certain things, but. It's not a preconceived notion of we want to be 50-50 or we want to be 60-40, whatever that looks like, or I want to get this guy so many touches or carries. 
and that's what's fun. That was what's fun about Cliff's offense is you never know week to week what they saw in the opposition that they would attack and try to punish because somebody's going to have a bad group of linebackers. Somebody's going to be weaker up front. Somebody's going to have bad corners that are slow, whatever, and you you need to have the ability to, to punish that that weak unit on, on defense. No question about it. Uh, you mentioned some things pertaining to the balance of an offense there, and that was something else that Coach Kitley talked about. Is there some desire to be 50-50 run pass, 70-30 either way, or is it more of a week-to-week -week approach possibly? Yeah, I think first and foremost you go in every week and you say, how do we attack them? You know, what's their weakness? You know, are, are, are they not as strong up front? So can we run the ball? Or, hey, maybe the, to me they're corners. That's the, the biggest weakness of the defense. So let's attack the corners. Uh, I don't necessarily believe in, hey, let's keep it 50-50 or, hey, I want to be 65% pass, 35% run. Again, I think the game is going to dictate a lot of play calls. Uh, I said it again, you know, it's kind of more about the players than it is the plays. You know, I'm, if we get out there and we can't throw the ball, we got to run the ball. And if we get out there and we're struggling to run the football, then we're going to probably put it in the air a little bit more. Uh, to me, I think that's how a game goes. And as a play caller, that's how I see the game. Uh, not necessarily do I want to do this or do I want to do that. I think you got to do what the defense gives you or, and also attack the, the weakness of the defense week in and week out. Yeah, and he, he's telling you – Players make plays. Players will dictate, and I think he's telling you and tell, told everybody, I love me some Sir Roderick Thompson and Taj Brooks. Those may be the best two guys on my side of the ball. And so, you know, they're going to get they're gonna get their touches, their looks, their involvement in the offense. And I think it's uh, – so, again, it's fun. What, what Murray State may dictate, because I think when you talk to people, Murray State really plays – they play it back. They want to keep everything in front of them. I don't want to say like Iowa State, but it's kind of that that we just want to we we don't want to give up any big plays. So it may be a big week for for guys like uh, uh, Taj and, and Sir Roderick. So, uh, but you know maybe uh, Houston's going to do something different and say we're going to play aggressive and play man to man, and the next week you can major in the deep ball. Anyway, I think I think people understand what we're saying, but uh, big fan of Zach and can't wait to see him kind of get going here. You know he's talking a good game about egoless play calling, but does he mean it? And I'm curious to see when the fur gets flying, what you revert to, because everybody's got tendencies. Everybody's got something they're more comfortable with or when the pressure is on that they feel like uh, they want to tap into. And I think we did hear a lot of similar things from Cliff Kingsbury about uh, playing or scheming week to week based on what the defense was going to give you. But I also feel like as a fan, I, I was frustrated many times in some feeling of Cliff Kingsbury whenever – the sledding was tough reverting to form, which was chuck it as often as you possibly can. It's three and out and maybe seven seconds taken off of the clock. That's a worst case scenario. But I felt like, you know, clearly, and this is just my own personal take, the history of play callers is one filled with ego. <laughs> Guys want to do what they want to do. And they've used all their brain power in the off season to drop these plays and these sets and these sequences and things like that, and they want to use them. So I don't think that Zach Kitley will be immune to those types of things, Chris, but I do think that those offensive play callers that can kind of fend off that ego at least or that pride for an extended period of time uh, will find some more success. And I'll tell you what, I'll mention it again because you can't have too many plugs. Our Black Label Radio conversation with Tyler Shuck, that's one thing that he mentioned was that he felt like you know, pride was not going to be the downfall of Zach Kitley whenever it comes to the way that he manages a game offensively. So I hope that's going to be the case. But you know what I'm saying? There's a certain personality type, I think, to a play caller, isn't there? Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, here's what we do. Good luck trying to stop it. I mean, right. this is, you know, we've repped this thing, you know, and and I, I agree. And, and I, I the, the times when, when Cliff uh, – when they would turn Mahomes loose, I didn't mind them throwing it all over the lot then. But absolutely uh, not. <laughs> yeah, but but yeah, I mean some of the other uh, years. But I, I and, and Zach is it's funny because he he took a I don't want to say a lot less money. He's well paid, but there there were big opportunities out there, and so that that part tells you a lot about who he is, the person, and where he wants to be. And uh, but I, I'm he's an easy guy to root for, man. I sure. mean he's just like his dad and. Uh, he, he was all about that cactus love this summer and loves it here. And, you know, I mean, just, just the whole thing that's going on here. He's a huge, huge part of it.
Well, just listening to the voice, he he sounds like a guy that should probably be uh, coaching college football in West Texas, at least for a period of time. So we're uh, glad to have him as long as we have the opportunity. And you hope he's having success. So others are knocking on his door, but maybe not too soon. And we can uh, get some wins with Coach Kitley roaming the sideline. Uh, coming up, we will discuss something we touched on actually yesterday, the initial Texas Tech depth chart. But one of those oddities that we didn't get to on yesterday's show, we want to spend some time on here today. It is going back to trying to decipher exactly what the word or means as it relates to a depth chart and two field goal kickers, uh, apparently, to start off the year for Joey McGuire. We'll get to that coming up next. But first, I want to tell you about our friends at betonline.net, the fastest, easiest way to check in on all the latest sports wagering odds and ends. Find your favorite sports and events right now at the number one online gambling source. You can also get news recaps from every league, every sport, baseball, football, basketball, hockey, combat sports, even video game players that Timmy's girlfriend break up with them this week. What does that do for the Call of Duty line? They probably know at betonline.net. So check it out there now. And if college football is on your mind, something I saw earlier today, perusing Bet Online, Chris, Biggest mover as far as the line this week for an underdog, Bowling Green at UCLA, where they have to be reminded they have a football team that's going to the Big Ten. Started out a 31-and-a-half point line in favor of UCLA, has moved eight points down to 23-and-a-half. I just love to see UCLA embarrassed, so I'm hoping that there's something to this. And I wanted to ask you, do we have any Red Raider friends still at Bowling Green, or is that crew cleared out of there? I think they're gone. Yeah. Okay. So I at think one point we had a bowling green rooting interest. We did. And some of those guys are actually here. Like Stephen Hamby, who I believe was at uh, bowling green at one point. Uh, Mike uh, Jinx. Where's yeah. he now? You know, off the top of your head. If you wouldn't have asked me that, I would have been able to tell you. Um, <laughs> he may be on Dana Holgerson's staff at the university of Houston, but I need to look at that. We're going to have to edit this out if, 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 I'm, <laughs> if I'm wrong. <laughs> uh, keep in mind, Bowling Green, UCLA, if you're looking for action this weekend, the second biggest mover in the Big 12 Conference, uh, one of the more interesting games that the league has to offer, and there's not many this opening weekend. It's Texas Christian in Colorado from Baylor. Texas Christian opened up as an eight-and-a-half point favorite, now extended to an 11-and-a-half point favorite. And look, I know what Colorado is, or more appropriately isn't, typically as a football team, but – Game one for Sonny Dykes for the Frogs and uh, a double-digit favorite on the road. I don't know about that, Chris. So the the line you're saying the line opened up and it's grown or yes, it's sir. shrunk eight okay, and a half to eleven and a half. Okay, see, and here here's the here's why I would throw a flag on that. By the way, Mike Jinks, the running backs coach at the University of Houston, nailed it. <laughs> I I Sonny Dykes has said he's going to play play three quarterbacks in that game. I would have thought the line would drop when that news comes out. Not because you can't do that. There's just no way. Every third series, you get a, everybody gets one quarter, and whoever did the best in their quarter gets the fourth. I mean, there's just no – that doesn't make any sense. So I would have thought that that would have hurt TCU's number than, than helped it. But No kidding. That's interesting. Uh, maybe 11.5 plus 11.5 for the Buffaloes is where the smart guys are lining up this weekend. Take your pick. Some of the more interesting ones we've seen so far this week right there, but plenty more to check out right now at betonline.net, where the game starts. On Texas Tech, it's your team every day. The Locked On Podcast Network. I'm Casey Cowan with Chris Level. And of course, we're looking ahead to Saturday night from Jones Stadium where the fur will be flying for real. It is Texas Tech and Murray State to open up the 2022 experience. Of course, first with Joey McGuire at the helm. And coming up as we wrap up the program a little bit later on, we'll be discussing something that was not on my bingo card coming into uh, this season. Whether or not Joey McGuire consulted the Old Testament whenever he chose Tyler Shuck as his starting quarterback. We'll get to that before we're done. Coming up in just a bit, but actually want to step back into the world of the depth chart. The magical, mystical, mythical depth chart, Chris. And one of the uh, more mysterious aspects to any depth chart, it seems, these days is the word or. 
And there are some places on Texas Tech's initial depth chart that certainly would have you maybe considering uh, something for the first time or information you weren't aware of coming into this. And one of those spots for me, at least, was the field goal kicking position of all places. And there's that word, or. It is Trey Wolf or Gino Garcia. Is this something or nothing or what? Did it get your attention? Yeah, I mean, it, it's something because you can't, like like the quarterback position, you can't really play two of these guys. You can't, you know, I mean, you can, I guess, continue with the kicking competition. But let's go back to – Trey Wolf is a fascinating case study uh, because, one, it's, it's a credit to him, and it's, I guess, at some level very surprising that he's still here because if you go back to 2019 – which is going back a ways, he's 20 for 22. He's a Lou Groza Award Watch finalist. He made his eight last field goals of the season. In fact, I think actually he may have I, – I, I think there's maybe only been one other 20-plus field goal season in Texas Tech history. He may have the second most in a season, I think. Somebody have to check me on that. But – and, and then, you know, the, then the last couple of years have happened. You had the pandemic year, and then you obviously had last year when Jonathan Garibay kind of emerged as the guy. So the fact that Trey is still here, again, is, again, easy guy to root for. I know that toward the end of camp, Trey and Gino had been fairly even. And uh, I think that they it, it was it was just one of those things where the kicking competition was – the numbers showed it was pretty even. There's not a lot to separate it. The only thing that you can go off of is what they've done previously. And obviously that includes practice. But Trey is, I want to say, like in his career, he's 21 of 28 from a field goal standpoint at Tech. There was just a that, that brief time when it just wasn't working for him. There was some missed short field goals. There was some missed you know, kind of uh, j just just some issues, almost where he just kind of like mentally I just kind of just lost it for a bit. Got the um, Vanderjacks. Yeah, kind of, yeah. yeah. It there's, happens. A j, there's a J in Vanderjack too, by the way, I think. <laughs> the um, Knoblocks. I mean, whatever <laughs> yeah. you want to call it. Yeah, and, and he's, uh, it just, it, it, sports are hard. It, it happens. And so, but if he channels, you know, his 19 you know, campaign. I mean, you, you, you're, you're not going to miss Jonathan Garibay a bit. And, and I, I think Garibay was close to coming back, but then you obviously have Gino, uh, you know, the Houston Baptist kid that he came in here and I think uh, he had a really good year last year. And Jared Castor, former tech lineman is down still at Houston Baptist. And obviously Zach had, had been around him from the, the year before when he was at Houston Baptist. So, mm -hmm. and then I'll tell you who really got, uh, Gino up here was uh, President Skubanek's son. Tyler Skubanek is is a main special teams coach, and was at Houston Baptist last year as well. And that's kind of the the, the relationship there. But I, I think Joey tipped his hand a little bit. Tyler, or excuse me, Trey Wolf will kick off. Trey Wolf will get the first kick, and so Trey Wolf's going to decide how this thing goes, not the other way around. You you, you make that first one. Yeah, you missed the first one, you know, I think, and then we see where we go from there. But I think Trey Wolf has won the job ever so slightly, and we'll see where we go from there. But, again, if he channels it, Lou Groza, a award watch guy. I mean, you yeah. know, in 20 of 22, that is a monster season for a kicker. You tell me right now, if you can have one of your kickers go 20 of 22, I'll tell you, you're going, you're going bowling. And and I, I would have in some way been a bit concerned that you kicked as many field goals or that you had to make as many field goals. But still, I'd take that in a heartbeat because how many times have we seen where, golly, if I just if we if I knew we could get three, I'd call plays differently, you know. And and some of that has happened to you in the last couple of years when you weren't sure if, if you could guarantee yourself three points. So maybe you go for it. Maybe you call oh, my. differently. Yeah. The world of college kickers, give me a break. I mean, we were just talking about bet online. There's been more cash change hands back and forth because of college kickers than probably anything you could come up with. I mean, that is a dicey proposition for most, but then those that really have that uh, that reliable guy obviously have a luxury. And I, I totally agree in that it, it shouldn't be any other way other than Trey Wolf's job 
to lose or to go get first or or whatever because of the skins that he's had on the wall. And I don't mind some competition, but uh, I certainly would like to see a guy, you know, establish a rhythm, establish some confidence uh, immediately. I feel like that may be a little bit easier for Wolf and that he's done it here and, and on this level uh, before. But Chris, one of the things that I feel like comes with the makeup of the kind of team that Texas Tech has had over the last few years, which is a team that has been led by their defense, for better or worse. Sometimes that's because the offense has been so limited. Sometimes it's been because the defense has had some talented players. But when you're that kind of team, which I like being, by the way, because that travels and will show up every Saturday, I feel like you're in more close games. I feel like in the third quarter, fourth quarter, the opportunity to win is there for you more often. Not that you're going to get over the hump more often. you still got to go out and score points, and the offense has got to make – uh, crunch time plays. I, do you agree or disagree? I just feel like when you have a, a defense of some sort, more often than not, and I understand you just have some terrible days sometimes, but more often than not, you're going to be in some tight spots in winning time late in the third or fourth quarters. And how about a field goal kicker that's reliable in those situations? Like you just said, maybe making up the difference and being bowl eligible or not, it could be the difference in, in one or two wins and, and that can make the difference in your season. You think Scott Frost would like uh, would, would love a really good field goal kicker? What was it? Was it like five and twenty one in one score games? I mean, oh seriously, yeah. I mean, so uh, because... not unless that guy was in his ear saying, "Hey, don't kick an onside kick <laughs> when we've got all the more." I almost yeah. feel like Matt Wells gave Scott Frost a call. It's like, "Hey, man, this one time in Stillwater, Oklahoma, it was hilarious," <laughs> and Frost <laughs> took him serious. <laughs> But that's you, a whole other conversation. But if if you can if you can get your three when you need it, boy, it makes everybody's life easier. And I think, again, I think I'm right here. I don't think Trey. I think some of the issues that he had were, um, 41, 43 type yard misses. I don't know if he's missed a field goal in college uh, under forty yards. I think he's perfect. So. Um, you know, we'll we'll see what that looks like. But in my opinion, Trey Wolf will decide how this goes. And that means we've got another type of variety for the definition of or. Because in this instance, or means it's actually the first guy's job probably to go lose. And I mean that very specifically. <laughs> that's has that's what it has to read as <laughs> very technically. I I think that that Trey Wolf is the guy that I, I'm probably betting on. I He's done it before, Chris, and I know that there were things that got in his way, and obviously the whole reason we saw Garibay last year was uh, you know, out of his control, but I, I just feel like he's got to be the guy, the odds-on favorite, uh, to be the one to maybe reestablish some confidence, get back into the rhythm, because, hey, man, we had a superstar kicker last year, right? It wasn't just like trying to fill the shoes of a guy that was pretty good. For whatever Garibay was, he was the god because he put it 62 to win a game against Iowa. There are not many people that leave a season even knowing who the kicker was, but we remember who the kicker was last year, right? Yes. And <laughs> and then, you know, unfortunately, Garibay gets the Cowboys camp and he it's like he just kind of kind of couldn't couldn't follow through with all of that. But it just goes to show you that 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 spot and that job is as mental as it is anything, you know, and you No question. K- kicker is the reason there are sports psychologists. I, and I think I'm being serious. I mean, because it, it's it's operation time. It's yeah, they got all that you're relying on these people, but so much of it is just mental. I mean, it, it, it just no is. But but Trey Wolf, man, rooting for that kid, and I and I hope it is his job. I hope he uh, knocks the first one through, and they send him back out there, and away we go. No doubt. So we've got the decision there. Still, for the most part, I suppose to be made uh, by Texas Tech head coach Joey McGuire. Coming up next, we'll get to a decision that has already been made when it comes to the Red Raiders starting quarterback. Decided to go with Tyler Shuck. But the question I'm sure we're all asking ourselves, did Coach McGuire consult the Old Testament? We'll explore coming up next on Locked On Texas Tech. You got it locked on Texas Tech L O double T with Chris Level. I'm Casey Cowan. Thanks for making it your first listen every day as part of the Locked On 
Podcast Network. Still plenty to get to coming up this week as we're getting ready for the Red Raiders and Murray State. Saturday night, we'll uh, spend some time talking specifically like we did earlier about Zach Kitley, about the guy on the other side of the football as the week rolls on. Uh, being the new defensive coordinator and Tim DeRuiter, and certainly age and seasoning wise, quite a different profile than Zach Kitley and your offensive coordinator. So we'll get to that coming up tomorrow. But uh, we had to get to this before we left you here today. Recently, Joey McGuire, the aforementioned Zach Kitley, made a decision as to which quarterback they're going with. Tyler Shuck was the man. He's QB1 for week number one, and we hope with some success and some uh, luck staying healthy for beyond but we must ask ourselves now in light of revelations from ann arbor michigan was the old testament consulted whenever it comes to this decision for joey mcguire should it have been here's a quote from local ann arbor crazy man <laughs> michigan head coach <laughs> john harbaugh who says about his approach to a quarterback competition this season which is not coming to an end. How many we got? Two or three, Chris? We got two guys for the first two games or three for the first three games? Yeah, he well, he's I think I think Jim is playing two in the first two games. They each get a game. Okay, there we go. And, so just two. Yeah. Which yeah. Which is crazy, it, but not as it, crazy as three. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he yeah, I don't know if you want to like. Yeah, let me tell you it, what, what is Coach it like Harbaugh. Solomon is it like the Book of Solomon or what, what was he saying? Here's what Coach Harbaugh had to say when asked about this unique approach. He says, "Quote: It's a process. It's a process. I mean, no person. It's biblical. No person knows what the future holds. It's a process, and we'll be based on performance. But we're not going to withhold any good thing. Both have been tremendous quarterbacks. We think that both are capable of leading our team to a championship. So that's good. We're going to keep cultivating that." People have asked, how did you come to that decision? Was it based on some kind of NFL model? No, it's really based biblical. Solomon, he was known for being a pretty, pretty wise person. He almost goes Larry David there at the end. Pretty, pretty wise person. I don't know what he's talking about, biblically speaking, yeah. but may I say, realistically speaking, this is an insane approach to deciding who a quarterback, uh, to deciding what starting quarterback is going to be your guy. Is it me, not? I've never heard about like anything similar to this. Let me ask you this question. We mentioned the TCU scenario earlier. Yes. Better to give each guy a full game or try to play three in one game? I'll just say this. On the TCU front, I'm not going out and saying three guys are playing. I obviously know that if we're in a position, and there are a couple of options here, either yeah. guy one and two suck, or we're killing Colorado and we could play, I could play Sonny Dyke's nephew if I wanted to at quarterback. Like those are the options. I'm not saying that before the game, though. In in the other scenario with uh Michigan, to me it's the same thing. I'm not saying well, no matter what happens in game one, this guy's getting game two. I used to have an insane high school basketball coach who scripted playing time. And I mean, guys are on a heater and he's like, well, my schedule says time for you to hit the bench. It's insane to me. I guess if I had my choice, it's clearly the Texas Christian approach to expecting, well, if the competition isn't over, we're probably going to see more guys. But how would I know prior to the game happening? You know, what if the first guy is just, Blowing the doors off. Well, then it's a blowout scenario. And I guess well, the other, well, he yeah. stinks. I got to sub him. I, I don't know. I don't like either one of them, Chris. That's my answer. N neither one of them are good. Completely agree. <laughs> and here's the thing. If you're like, oh, if you're, if you're playing for Jim Harbaugh, let's just take Texas Tech's two game, first two yeah. games of the season. If we're going to do it that way, I'd raise my hand and be like, hey, coach, I, I, can I play the Murray State game? And I'd let the other guy <laughs> right. play the Houston game. I mean, you know, I mean, like, yeah, that, that's what it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, but we, we see, you know, and I, th I think it was, it's Brian Kelly at LSU that just is not ready to tell anybody who his starter is going to be either uh, at LSU. And you've got Steve Sarkeesian that won't relieve it, release a depth chart. Uh, and some people are really, really bugged about that. Other people don't care or feels like, feel like it's meaningless. Uh, but uh, anyway, it's just... I, I uh, think it's stupid to care that he didn't, and I also think it's stupid to not. 
<laughs> is that fair? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like both can me- be true. The media both- like up in arms like, oh, where's our depth chart? Well, you're- Shut up. Go play a game of golf or something and get a drink. Uh, but on the other side, Sarkeesian, like going back to the Fort Knox thing we were talking about yesterday. Are, are you going to lose the game if you release a depth chart? Like, can you not win without someone knowing what your starting lineup looks like? I think it's like an indictment on the coach almost. Well, but it, it's uh, it's a waste of time to think about what other people think about your depth chart and to hide it and in all the the things that are going to go with not wanting to release it. Like, if you're, you know, I, I think it tells you a lot about like the situation in Texas too. I know we were talking about the Michigan quarterback situation. I, I just think it's mismanaged. I think the whole thing is very bizarre. I think they're going to get blitzed by Alabama uh, in, a, in a week or two. And, you know, I think there's major questions going on there. But to not release a depth chart is just not a good look, in my opinion. On, let me yeah. Let me ask you this question as it relates to Texas Tech. I almost feel like the quarterback room for Zach Kittley and Joey McGuire would justify itself more so to saying, well, we've got – we're giving these guys each an audition, whether in game or in multiple weeks, because your backup won conference games last year. He won a bowl game last year. Like if there's any type of setting within the quarterback competition to maybe on like the craziest day you have in the week, justify that argument, it would be the kind of setting that tech has because your backup guy is pretty good. But I just don't, you have only so much time to settle the competition. And if the competition is not settled, then I think you still have to make a choice and say, this is literally the first guy that's taking the snap. Shout out to Cliff Kingsbury. This is the guy that's trotting out there and who you're going to see to start the football game. And it's not some like new thing that if he stinks and the competition really hadn't been settled all that much anyway, that you go to the next guy. But I, I don't know. I don't like the feel. I mean, Harbaugh's thing is insane. I don't know what you're talking about. And I was looking up, I think it's, <laughs> Uh, Hawaii, hey, hey. Colorado State, and yeah, hey man, UConn, no, nobody playing. knows what's gonna what's in store for us as we no. live. I mean, we we nobody can predict that, <laughs> and that is biblical. But that doesn't mean be comfortable <laughs> walking out into traffic with a blindfold on. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think you'd find any scripture <laughs> right. to suggest right. you should do that either, even though that is engaging in the unknown. I don't uh, I don't know that there was necessarily you know, a huge gap between Tyler Shuck and Donovan Smith. But clearly we felt like, I think going through the off season, kind of to go back to the kicker conversation, Chris, that there was going to be something comparable in the fact that Tyler Shuck was more than likely going to be viewed as the leader and more than likely maybe viewed as the guy uh, whose job it was to lose. But even if that margin is razor thin, that you think this is number one and this is number two, number one is the guy that I think you've got to throw all your weight behind going into the game. It's a mind game to some degree for your coach to say, oh, well, this is the number one guy, but I guarantee you we're going with the other guys as well. Isn't it? Isn't it almost like kneecapping your guy's confidence to a degree? Uh, it, it can be. I, I, I tell you what, what Zach Kitley said yesterday, and this was, this was pretty telling. He said there wasn't a trainer, a GA, a coach, a player that was around here all summer and fall camp that had any different feeling about who the starting quarterback should be so much so that he and Joey really never had to meet about it and discuss, okay, what do we want to do here? Mm -hmm. It was very, very obvious. And I think, and I think Joey's gone out of his way to post stuff on social media and give Tyler the respect of winning the job. You know, the, the feelings of Donovan and, and Baron be damned from that standpoint. It's just, hey, this guy won a really tough quarterback race. And so we are going to tip our cap and give him the respect that he he's deserves and and all that. Having said all that, you still may see Donovan uh, in the game Saturday night. So uh, how about sure. that? Yeah. Because either Tech will be routing the opponent <laughs> right. or Shuck will have stunk beyond belief. Like those are the two options that are always there. I feel like if you're yeah. again, competition is not really settled. But I I don't know what it says to number one when your head coach is saying, "Well, there's going to be a second and there's going to be a third. Now it may just be because you think Colorado is the worst team on the face of the earth. I, that's an interesting situation to do it again. I mean, it's a Power Five opponent on the road, <laughs> and you're saying something like that. So some unique approaches to settling the quarterback 
competition dust elsewhere, but I think I'm glad here locally, Chris, that we just uh, settled with the old tried and true. Announce a guy. Go with him. <laughs> Announce it, tweet it, salute him, and, and we move on. Absolutely. That's exactly right. Yes. And if you got to make a decision down the road, you'll make a decision down the road. You know, there's a reason we know Chris Todd's name, even though he played behind uh, one of the greatest quarterbacks in the history of Texas Tech. Screw you, Missouri, is all I can say for that day. <laughs> Chris, we're out of time, my man. Uh, it flies fast whenever you got so much to get into, like we've been able to get into this week, getting ready for Red Raider football. But we're going to keep doing that. As I mentioned, we'll get into the new defensive coordinator for Texas Tech, Tim DeRuiter, coming up on the other side as we inch closer and closer to the Red Raiders and Murray State. Enjoyed it again, Chris. We'll see you tomorrow. Keep hope alive, people. You got it. For Chris Level, I'm Casey Cowan. This is Locked On Texas Tech. Appreciate you for making it your First listen on the Locked On Podcast Network. It's your team every day. And want to make sure that you know after Locked On Texas Tech to make the Ultimate Pro Football Preview 2022 your second listen. From the Locked On Podcast Network, it's an eight-episode extravaganza to get you ready for the National Football League. You've got local experts for your team, the Locked On Podcast Network, bevy of all-stars, Locked On Cowboys, Locked On Chiefs, Locked On Texans, whatever you're into here in the great state. They've got it covered from every angle as well as the action. Betting angles from Lee Sterling of Locked On Bets, all combining into one Ultimate NFL Preview. So search right now for Ultimate Pro Football Preview 2022 on YouTube or anywhere you get your podcast. And of course, do the same for Locked On Texas Tech. Would appreciate you subscribing there on YouTube or anywhere you get your podcast. We're back at it coming up tomorrow on the Locked On Podcast Network on Locked On Texas Tech.